you have a Bible with you, do turn to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 8, and we'll be looking at the, the verses that Tim read from verse 1 through to verse 17, so Matthew in chapter 8. Have you ever felt like an outsider anywhere? Have you ever felt like an outsider? Uh, I have a number of times, and when I wrote down this question to, to introduce our sermon this morning, the first thing that sprung to mind was the time I went to the ballet. Have you ever been to a ballet? I've never been to a ballet. I went to a ballet about, uh, it must be 12, 13 years ago, I guess, uh, because Lou and I were going out at the time. And I have to be honest, I have rarely felt quite so out of place. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it, you know, uh, men in pink tights, unusual for me to see, but I felt somewhat out of place. I grew up in a northern working class town in Cumbria. We didn't have the ballet. Uh, I felt really quite strange. I remember looking up and down the rows beside me thinking, they don't look and seem like me. <laughs> I'm sure you've had experiences like that as well. Certain company you've been in, certain places you've gone to, uh, where you have felt a little out of place. you felt like an outsider. It, it may even have happened to you walking into church the first time. If you didn't grow up in a Christian home, you, you probably felt, oh, this is a bit strange. You maybe felt like an outsider. Well, our, our passage this morning has uh, three sections to it, if you like. Uh, three healing miracles um, that Jesus does for specific people. And then there's a, a fourth, if you like, which is a lot of people healed at the end, a summary of his healings. Uh, but each of the three individuals who were healed were outsiders in different ways, actually. Uh, the first person healed in verses 1 to 4 is a leper. The second person healed uh, in verses 5 to 13 is the, the servant of a, a Gentile centurion. Uh, the third one uh, in verses 14 and 15 is a woman. All of these people would have been outsiders in first century Jewish society. A leper, a centurion and his servant, uh, a woman. But Jesus came for them. Jesus came for them. Jesus came, we're going to summarise our passage this morning, we can say it in three ways. Jesus came for weak and diseased outsiders. Therefore Jesus came for you and Jesus came for those you know and love. So first of all, as we look at these verses, let's think about the fact that Jesus came for weak and diseased outsiders. This is really what the passage is about. Matthew tells us as much right at the end in verse 17. He says, uh, this was done so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. He, Jesus himself, took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. Uh, you can see straight away uh, that we have a, a weak and diseased outsider uh, in verses 1 to 4. Uh, we have a man with leprosy. Uh, now, uh, if you've read the Bible and you're familiar with the Bible, uh, you'll know that, that lepers were almost the ultimate outsiders in Jewish society. Uh, the Old Testament law uh, said that anyone who had leprosy, and leprosy was a, a catch-all term, not just for what we specifically call leprosy today, a specific disease, but any disease of the skin, really. Uh, the Old Testament law said that anyone who had skin disease, like leprosy, they were not allowed to be part of everyday society anymore. They had to distance themselves from everybody else, they had to make sure that people were aware that they had leprosy if somebody began to approach them because they basically had to go into self-quarantine. 
That must have been incredibly difficult, mustn't it? Uh, we've thought about this before, but probably the last 18 months has taught us just something of how difficult that must have been. Uh, to be isolated uh, because of a disease. And nobody wanted to be anywhere near a leper, basically. And they were unclean. I wouldn't want to be one, would you? They weren't allowed in people's homes. Uh, they weren't allowed in the synagogue. They definitely weren't allowed in the temple in Jerusalem. They couldn't attend all the feasts and so on of the people. They just had to be out on their own or in perhaps with a few other lepers. Put out of society. Which makes what Jesus does here quite astounding. He's just finished the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7. He comes down from the mountain in verse 1. Large crowds are following him. But I'm guessing those large crowds parted. As a man with leprosy comes up to Jesus and kneels before him. Most people would have run away. They'd have got out of there as quick as they could. But Jesus doesn't. He listens to the, what the man has to say. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What would Jesus' response be? It's not get out of here. It's not what on earth do you think you're doing? You know you're not allowed to come let anywhere near me or anyone else. Look at what he says. Well, first of all, look at what he does. Reaching out his hand, he touched him. He touched him. I've lost count of the number of times now that we've heard over the last year and a half of the people who were living on their own during the, the pandemic, missing human touch not just company but touch a leper never knew human touch Jesus reaches out and touches him an even more significant act in many ways than speaking to him because you can speak from a distance can't you you can't touch from a distance he goes right up to him he touches him and he says, I am willing to be made clean. Jesus came for, for weak and diseased outsiders. He came for a man with leprosy. We see the same thing with the, the centurion in verses 5 to 13. The centurion was a commander of a hundred men in the Roman army. He would not have been Jewish. He would have been a Gentile. A Gentile is anyone who isn't Jewish. Uh, but that brought with it uh, a certain stigma, if you like, if you were living in Palestine amongst Jewish people. If you were serving in pretty much any other part of the empire... Uh, you could have easily blended in to the local culture, fairly easily anyway. Uh, people would have associated with you. But, but not so much if you were a Gentile in first century Jewish society. The Jews kept their distance from the Gentiles. They didn't go near them. Jesus was a Jew. Here comes a Gentile. Verse 5. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralysed in terrible agony. Well, first of all, a Gentile centurion wouldn't normally get much of a hearing in Jewish society. But let alone the servant of a Gentile centurion. You almost maybe get the impression that Jesus wouldn't either in verse 7. Jesus said to him, am I to come and heal him? 
Now, we don't know the exact tone Jesus used when he said that. But Jesus is astonished by what the centurion replies, and we'll come back to it later. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Maybe he knew that the Jews wouldn't go under the roof of a Gentile. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. We'll come back to the bit about a man being under authority and so on. But you know what happens, doesn't it? Jesus is amazed at this Gentile's faith and heals his servant. Jesus came for the the Jewish outsider, like a, a man with leprosy, a Jew with leprosy. He came for the Gentile outsider. He welcomes them. This is the sort of man who will be in the kingdom of heaven, he says in verse 11 and then lastly verses 14 and 15 uh, women as outsiders Uh, like many ancient cultures uh, Judaism tended to exclude women in many ways not just ancient cultures cultures today can do that too can't they But in verse 14, Jesus goes into Peter's house. That's Peter, one of the disciples. And he notices something that maybe others wouldn't notice. He enters the house. He sees Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He doesn't think, well, she's not that important. She's just an old lady. She's probably towards the end of her life anyway. No, he touches her hand. Again, touch acceptance, drawing in someone who's potentially an outsider and the fever left her. One principle from this passage, one thing we learn is that Jesus comes from those who we might consider to be outsiders. He welcomes the outsider. He even seeks them out. That's a challenge for us, isn't it? As Christians, as those who Jesus has come and got, have we remembered, have we remembered that we were outsiders once too? Uh, We were outsiders when it comes to being part of God's family. We were far from God. We didn't deserve to be in his family. We weren't in his family But Jesus sought us out. He probably sought us out through Christians, didn't he? It might have been your parents. It might have been a friend at work or school. Uh, It might have been another family member. It, It might have been a stranger. I don't know all your stories of how you came to faith. But you were an outsider. And Jesus sought you out. Our task is to reach the outsider. It might mean associating with people that we might find it strange to associate with, even with people who go to the ballet. And much worse. But are we willing to do that? Are we ready to do that? Do we do church in such a way that we make the outsider feel welcome? So they understand as much as possible. Uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians Make sure you're doing ways in a way that an outsider will understand so that they may too see that God is with you and bow down and give him glory. Jesus came for those we consider outsiders. Remember, you were one once too and he came for you. And that's our second point. Jesus came for you. Particularly we see this in verses 1 to 4. Well, let's think about it from verses 1 to 4. Remember, this is the leper. Now, you might think, I'm not a leper. I don't have a a skin disease that means I've got to quarantine myself permanently. That's not me. But leprosy in the Bible is a picture of all of us. We all have a form of leprosy. In fact, we thought about it in the children's talk. We all have diseased hearts. We all have sin-sick hearts. How 
have you recognised that you do? Uh, You see, this man with leprosy, he wasn't self-delusional, was he? He didn't come up to Jesus thinking, I'm not a leper, I'll be fine. I can go up to this man, there's nothing wrong with me at all, he'll be glad to see me. I can go to him. No, he knew exactly what he was. He had leprosy and he knew it. That's why he says, verse 2, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Have you recognised that you have a, a sin sickness in your heart? Have you recognised that it's that very sin sickness that keeps you from God? If you have, have you also seen that you can approach Jesus? That almost sounds contradictory, doesn't it? It's sin that stops us approaching God, and yet you can come to Jesus. You can. You can be made clean. What's the the greatest thing, the first priority, when you come to Jesus? What's the first thing to approach him for? I don't know what your prayer life is like. I know what mine can be like at times. Sometimes the thing most on our minds and hearts when we approach Jesus is, I'm not well, I'm feeling ill. Please, Jesus, make me better. And I don't mean sin there. I mean, maybe you suffer with chronic pain, which is awful. Or something of that sort. Or, or maybe the first thing on your mind when you come to Jesus is, my circumstances are not good. I'll approach Jesus about my circumstances. Or, or maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's just your general mood. But of course our first priority ought to be, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need cleansing. And if you're willing, I know you could make me clean. Well, the good news is he is willing. Absolutely. He's waiting to reach out and touch you and cleanse you when you come to him. But you need to recognise that you're a leper first. Have you recognised that actually you're not worthy of coming to him? You, You are an outsider, that you can't do anything yourself that will make you acceptable, but you can come and say, clean me, forgive me. And that's what Jesus does, isn't it, at the cross. He takes our sins upon himself when we come to him and he carries them away as he pays for them at Calvary. As he dies for us to cleanse us from our sin. And of course that cleansing is always with a purpose in mind so that we are accepted. This leper had to go and tell Moses, uh, not tell Moses, tell the priests that uh, he had been cleansed and show them as Moses commanded. That's because then the priest could say, right, you're welcome back into society now. You can go in people's houses. You can come to the synagogue. You can come to the feasts. You can enter the temple. You can be part of God's people again in that way. That's why we need forgiveness. That's why we need cleansing. So that we can be welcomed into God's people, into his family, have a relationship with him. Forgiveness serves an end and it's fellowship with God living as his people to glorify him. So Jesus came for you in all your weakness, disease and sin. Have you come to him recognising that you need him to cleanse you? And then lastly, Jesus came for those you know and love. If you're a Christian this morning, and I know uh, many of us are, there are those you know and love, aren't there, that are not yet Christians. Colleagues, neighbours, husbands, wives, parents, children, brothers, sisters, 
the list can go on and on. Well, Jesus came for people like that. He came for the centurion's servant. I think the centurion was already a Christian. He was already a believer in Jesus as we come to this passage. It's actually the centurion not coming on behalf of himself at this point, but on behalf of his servant, isn't it? When Jesus entered Capernaum, verse 5, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralysed in terrible agony. I think this is a man with a changed heart. I'm sure many a centurion didn't treat their servants and their slaves, basically, with any great care. Uh, Let alone (laughs) plead for them when they're ill. But this is a man who is a Christian, And he's pleading on behalf of his servant. Did Jesus come for people that you love? And then in verse 14, Jesus went into Peter's house. Peter is already a follower of Jesus and saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. And he heals her. Again, Jesus comes for the people that we know and love. That's an encouragement, again, for our prayer and witness, isn't it? You will have those that you love, that you know, who don't know the Lord Jesus. And it may well break your heart that they don't. But Jesus has come for people like them, outsiders like them. I think we can be particularly encouraged by the way the centurion approaches this. How does the centurion approach Jesus in order to basically plead, pray for this servant that he loves and he cares for? Well, as he comes to him, he doesn't ask Jesus to heal his servant on the basis of his own, the centurion's own good works. We learn from Luke's Gospel that he could have done that. Uh, Matthew gives us a kind of abbreviated version of what happens here. Uh, But Luke fills in a few more details. Uh, This centurion, he was a Gentile, he was an outsider, uh, but he was an unusual one. Uh, Many of the Jewish people in the area this uh, centurion lived actually really liked him. They wouldn't have gone in his house, but they did like him. He'd built their synagogue. He cared for them. He'd done a lot of good. But it's not on the basis of any credit he might have felt he'd built up with the Jewish people by the way he treated them, which was well. He doesn't approach Jesus on that basis, does he? His prayer is not made on that basis. He doesn't come to Jesus and say, "Um, look, I've done my best for, for your people. I've sought to serve them as well as I can. I've undertaken even this building project for them, where I've I've built them this this synagogue where you all meet together and and I I don't get to come in. But I've built it for them. (laughs) No, he doesn't do that, does he? In verse 8, he doesn't approach with any bargaining chips. He just confesses how unworthy he is. So Jesus asked that question, am I to come and heal him? Verse 8, Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Is that the way we approach God in our prayers, even when we pray for others? Do we say, Lord, I've I've tried so hard to love them. I've tried so hard to explain the gospel. Look at all I've done. Or do we come and say, I'm not worthy that you would hear this prayer of mine. But will you, anyway? We don't approach God on the basis of our good works, do we? Not when we become a Christian, when we first come and confess that I'm a leper in my heart. We don't come claiming we're good. But we don't as we go on in our Christian life. 
We don't approach God based on our good works. We don't ask God for things based on our good works. We continue to confess our own unworthiness. We sang about that in the song we just sang. Our worth isn't in anything about us in and of ourselves. We're unworthy of God's blessing and yet we can ask for it. As long as we recognise that we're unworthy of it. So that's the first thing when we pray for our loved ones. Do pray for them. Do ask that God would heal them. Do. But don't do it based on, Lord, I've done all this for them. Do it recognising, I'm unworthy, but I know you're a God of grace. Secondly, do it with faith. Uh, A faith that is born out of a recognition of of who Jesus is and his authority. Uh, So this centurion, having spoken of his unworthiness before Jesus, the next thing he he says shows his faith in Jesus. His faith. He simply says in the second half of verse 8, Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Isn't that amazing? That's faith, isn't it? That's incredible faith. There's a faith in Jesus there that he's able to deal with the desperate illness of his servant who is at the point of death and say, Jesus, I, don't, I know that you don't even need to come under my roof. I'm not worthy that you come under my roof and I know that you don't need to come under my roof to heal him. You can do it just by saying a word. That's commendable, isn't it? I wonder if we pray with faith like that for the salvation of our family, our friends, our neighbours, our colleagues. Jesus, you can do this with a word. Faith. But where does that faith come from? Well, part of the answer is given by the centurion himself in verse 9. It's based on his understanding of who Jesus is and Jesus' authority. Uh, Prayer involves faith, doesn't it? It involves faith. Faith that Jesus can do what we cannot. Uh, This man says to Jesus, For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now what is Jesus' response to, to those words? They may not mean much yet, but Jesus' response in verse 10 is this. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. With so great a faith. Remember, this this centurion, he will have heard about Jesus already or he wouldn't be doing what he's doing here. No doubt he's heard about Jesus' words, about Jesus' deeds. And based on what Jesus has said and done, he's come to the conclusion, this man has great authority. He's heard the teaching, he's heard about the miracles, and he's come to the conclusion, I can trust Jesus for anything. This man can do anything. He uses his own illustration to to explain why to Jesus. He compares his own role in the Roman army to how Jesus operates in this world. And this is how Jesus operates in this world. The centurion begins by saying that he, like Jesus, is a man under authority. In the centurion's case, he was under the authority of those higher up in the army than him and ultimately under the authority of the Roman Emperor. Uh, Jesus came into this world under the Father's authority, God the Father. He came to do his Father's will. But the centurion goes on to say, 
I also have those who are under me who come and go at my command and, and do as I tell them. And that's because he acts not only under the emperor's authority, but with the emperor's authority for those under his command. And this was quite an insight on his part. He realised that it was the same with Jesus. Jesus acts not only under the Father's authority, but with the Father's authority. He does in this world what only God has the power to do. He is God the Son, acting under his Father's authority and with it. So the Roman soldier concludes, I put my faith in you. You can do this with a word. And Jesus marvels at it. I wonder if our prayers have that same faith. And now I know it it only takes the, the tiniest amount of faith, as long as it's faith in Jesus, to save a person. But nevertheless, we want our faith to grow, don't we? We want our prayers to be filled with faith that Jesus can save. Save your spouse. Save your children. Save your colleagues. Save our neighbours. Now, of course, it isn't the case that if only we had enough faith, everyone would be saved. It doesn't work like that, I know. But nevertheless, we can pray believing that he is able. He is able. And we should pray knowing that he has the authority to save all that the Father has given him. And he will. So be encouraged in your prayer life. Go on praying for those lost people that you know and love. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing that. He came to carry the weaknesses, diseases, sin of people like them. His arm is not shortened such that he cannot save. I love this passage. It speaks to all of us, doesn't it? Jesus came for the outsider. If you're still an outsider to God's grace and God's family and God's kingdom, he came for someone just like you. And you can come to him. And he won't push you away. He will heal you. As you confess your own unworthiness. He came for those you know and love, Christian. People just like them. Keep praying. Let's not give up. Let's make a place for the outsider and pray that they would be healed and they would come to know Jesus. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you rescued us. Once more, those of us who know you, we thank you that when we were outsiders, you called us to yourself. Uh, You touched us with your grace and your forgiveness as we recognised, because of your Spirit's work in us, our need of you. Lord, help us never to forget that. Help us to remember that we weren't worthy and we aren't worthy of such love. And yet you considered us worth dying for. You shed your blood for us. Help us to pray on as well for those we know and love who are still sick with sin, who are still on the outside, who are headed for hell, as Jesus speaks of in this passage. Lord, help us to witness to them. Help us to pray for them. Not on the basis of how well we may have evangelised, how well we may have loved them, or we may have done for them, but recognising they were unworthy, trusting that you are mighty to save. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would save those we know who do not know you. We ask it for their good 
and for your glory. Amen.